little bit about the motivations for this deal. We can get into how it was allowed to happen in a sec, right. but why is it happening? You know, like a lot of uh, sectors in, within the media sector overall, there's a big move towards consolidation as the media business kind of matures in the U.S. Now a lot of companies, whether it's in the cable television business or in the content business or even in the broadcasting business, are looking for more scale to get control over their costs and drive more profits to the bottom line in an environment where the growth rate for a lot of advertising and affiliate fees and those things that drive the top line have been slowing for a lot of the media sectors. What does the regulatory landscape in Washington look like right now when it comes to media? Ajit Pai has been out giving speeches, talking about net neutrality, scaling that back. Uh, especially in this sector, how is it changing? This has been a 180 degree turn since Trump came into the White House uh, and you know installed a Republican-led FCC. In terms of deregulation, a lot of the media sectors are really looking for aggressive deregulation to come from this FCC. Uh, initially, uh, in the television space, they, they scaled back or they pulled back that UHF discount or they reinstated the UHF mm -hmm. discount. Just simply allows station groups to buy more stations did they get under the ownership cap? That was a very deregulatory move that uh, the new FCC was able to do immediately, and that allowed this transaction to happen. Ajit Pai has been on the FCC, I think, since 2012. Was a lot of this telegraphed? Did, did the executives of these companies have a suspicion uh, or know uh, that so much was going to change? Uh, they did. It was, a, it was a big surprise, not only for, uh, you know, for a lot of people, but certainly the broadcasters when Trump won, and they really thought, wow, for the first time in eight years, we're going to have a really deregulatory FCC, and that's going to allow us to push a lot of deals through. So there's actually more room to go, I think, in terms of deregulation. There's a lot more things that the FCC is looking at uh, that may even eliminate the ownership cap in general to allow a station owner, in theory, to control 100 percent or have coverage of 100 percent of the country. Sinclair believes that, uh, and this is the first step uh, in, in their path to getting even bigger. Uh, before we move on here, what's the role of WGN in all of this, this Tribune-owned cable network? Yeah, it's, it remains to be seen whether Sinclair wants to keep this. They have WGN, which was a super station. They try to convert it into a more broader uh, uh, consumer cable network. Has not worked out for the Tribune company. The Tribune company also has a stake in the Food Network, which is a very successful cable network along with Scripps Networks. That can also be monetized by Sinclair. So Sinclair's identified about $2.5 billion of non-core assets they're acquiring in this transaction that they could sell to raise capital to pay down uh, debt. So there's a lot of optionality there for Sinclair um, with this acquisition. What are we seeing with Comcast and Charter? today. Yeah, Comcast and Charter are saying, listen, we think we need to offer a wireless service to our customers. We think our customers want not just video and high-speed broadband and, and landline phone, but they also want the quad play of a wireless service. Gone so, is the triple play, now yeah, the quad yeah, play. Now, yes. it's a, now, now it's a quad play. It's all the rage in Europe, and they're trying to replicate it here in the U.S. In order to do that, the question is, do they build a wireless network, or do they go out and buy one like T-Mobile or Sprint? I don't think they're quite sure yet. At the early stages here, both Charter and Comcast have said, let's try to build it on our own. And this announcement today was, let's share some back, so back office, let's share some tech technology. Uh, and the key thing is, there's a provision in this agreement where they do not buy a or, or sell themselves to a wireless carrier. So they're really saying, for the next year, we're going to try to figure this out on our own. If, you know, after that year, then, then we'll see what we're going to do. How does an, uh, an AT&T or a Verizon Wireless react to what they're seeing here today uh, with Comcast and Charter? Well, I think it's, it's clearly a new player into the marketplace. Now, you could say with four national wireless carriers, that's one too many or maybe even two too many. So now you're going to introduce potentially uh, a, an additional player into the marketplace in the, in the case of Comcast and Charter in their respective footprints not good for the existing wireless infrastructure here. So a lot of people still believe that the wireless business in the United States needs to contract, needs to consolidate some more. So you don't really need four or four and a half players. You need something less than that. The question is, are the cable companies going to be buyers, sellers, or are they going to be uh, content just to be niche players within their footprints so that they can offer their consumers a, a quad play? How unprecedented is this tactical move? Is Comcast and Charter working together? It's interesting. The cable industry has actually worked fairly well together because they had their own little monopolies in their individual markets, so they really weren't competing against each other. Uh, they've always had this business out in Colorado called Cable Labs, where yeah. they really shared on technology developments. They worked together. This is maybe just a, a different version of Cable Labs where they're, where they're saying, listen, in our respective marketplaces where we don't compete, let's share technology, share some of the best ideas and best practices uh, so that we can grow our respective cable industry. It's good for everybody. So there is actually precedent.
precedent here in the cable industry for these guys working together. And is technology a motivating factor here? Is the movement to 5G something that's accelerating the, the kind of moves that we're seeing? I think so. I think, you know, there's, you know, as more and more traffic goes on to wireless devices, more and more video traffic goes on to wireless devices, the business there, the, the, the revenue there for creators of content as well as the platforms, the, the, the networks themselves, um, continues to be something that's very attractive. Uh, the question from the wireless perspective, though, is, again, how many national carriers do you really need to economic, economically serve the marketplace? So, um, but clearly, wireless growth, wireless demand continues to surge. You see it across the ecosystem. Um, and I think the cable companies are figuring out we really don't have a play here mm -hmm. yet. Do we need one? And I think they're trying to figure that out literally as we speak. And this announcement today was just another way to say, let's take the next year and try to figure this out. Just lastly here, how much of this do you ascribe to John Malone, big charter shareholder, and his vision for where things are going? Sure. I think, you know, John Malone has been a leader, a visionary for the cable industry really for the last 40 years. And I think his hand is clearly a play here, um, you know, clearly a controlling shareholder of charter, a long relationship with the Roberts family at Comcast. Uh, and I think, you know, they kind of see eye to eye on this, that there's another leg up for this cable industry in the United States. Uh, there's probably room for even more consolidation, greater growth, uh, and there's moves into other businesses, whether it's data, whether it's content directly, or whether it's wireless.